Uh, today we're continuing octophonic sound in Super Collider. Uh, primarily today I'd like to introduce another U-Gen, which is really useful, not just for eight-channel sound, but for uh, multi-channel sound in general, which is um, Super Collider here. And uh, I've got some pre-built code here just to, as a starting point. Um, uh, the Eugen I want to introduce today is Splay A Z. So this looks sort of similar and is sort of related to Pan A Z, which we covered last week. Um, so Pan A Z takes a monophonic signal and uh, pans it in a circular array of speakers according to a, uh, bi a bipolar normalized pan argument from minus one to one. Uh, so there, there is an object called splay, just simple, just regular old splay, and then there's splay az. So splay is the stereo version of splay az. Um, so in splay, we give, we provide splay with an array of an arbitrary number of signals. Um, yes, sorry, I'll increase the size. Sure. And increase this as well. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So splay receives for its first argument an array of signals. The size of the array is limited only by the power of your computer. And what splay does is it um, uh, spatializes those signals across the stereophonic field. Um, so if you give it an array of two signals, it will put one in the left speaker one on the right speaker. If you give it an array of three signals, it will put one in the left, one panned centrally, sort of equally between the two speakers, and then the third one on the right. And if you give it an array of ten signals, it will sort of pan them from left to right, equidistantly spaced. Display AZ is the arbitrarily multi-channel version of that. So you provide Splay AZ with the number of channels, the corresponding to the ring of speakers you're working with. I guess it defaults to four here. Um, and uh, then you give it an arbitrary size array of signals. And it will spatially position those signals in the order of the array around your ring of speakers. So this is a really powerful tool, especially when you combine it with multi-channel expansion. So I want to revisit that. Um, so here is our startup code. And I have uh, three sound files today, um, which I've got. Let's, let's see what we have here in my source folder. I have uh, swirling maracas. I'm not sure why that's coming out of the left speaker. Uh, muffled rattle being sustained, and then this wood creaking sound. Um, so here they are. I think we've loaded them up, so we should be able to play them here. Now I've chosen these sounds because they are spectrally rich, so they've got sort of a wide noisy spectrum. They're um, percussively rich. They've, they've got this sort of percussive pointillistic character to them. And in my opinion, these kinds of sounds work really well in multi-channel context because you can just fill the space with these organic pointillistic crackly textures and then process them and, you know, filter them in various ways. So I'd like to begin with a, a synthesis function. Uh, in which we're going to play this sound file, apply some multi-channel expansion, um, do a little bit of resonance, and then use splay az to make an arbitrary number of them, all uh, filling the space. Okay, so we are going to start with play buff, and I believe all of these sound files are monophonic, so we're going to tell play buff to play a one-channel buffer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bypass the whole making a synth def and making arguments for now. I'm, I'm taking the 
a sort of quick and sloppy approach to making sound, which is fine, but you can always just take a few minutes at some point and convert a sound function into a proper synth def uh, to make it more uh, reusable and more modular. So we're going to use this one, B at 2. Uh, playback rate, we'll default that to 1. Uh, trigger, we'll set that to a default of 1 as well, because we want to trigger the sound file when we first start this function. Start position 0, and we will loop the uh, sound file. And all of a sudden, these 1s and zeros just don't look so attractive to me. I'm just going to skip right over those defaults and say loop 1. And because we're looping, we'll never get to our done action, so there's no reason to provide anything. There, there is no end to this sound if we loop it. Um, a little bit of amplitude adjustment, just to be sort of safe, and play this out to output 2, which in this particular case, with this particular interface in Studio, corresponds to the front center speaker. And also keep in mind that I've configured the analog mixer to be uh, all, you know, properly set for circular 8-channel panning. Okay, now it's time to open our level meters so we can see what's going on in addition to hear what's going on. That's, we don't need quite so much amplitude attenuation. So a quick recap of multi-channel expansion. If we take any signal and at the end of it say dot dupe and then two, we turn that signal into an array of signal copies. So dupe four and dupe eight. And when we output an array of signals, Super Collider just assigns them in numerical order to the ascending outputs. And we've got the mixer configured so that outputs 2 through 9 correspond to front center and then going around in a clockwise circle. And as a syntax shortcut, you don't have to say all this stuff with the dupe 8. You can just say exclamation point 8. And that's exactly the same. So from here, we can do interesting things. Uh, Let's, for readability, let's space out our arguments a little bit. Oops. Right. For rate, we can say, um, let's not just have them all default to 1, but we can have um, an array of 8 random values. There are multiple ways to do this. You can say array dot fill um, size 8 I think this is a little too small for me even I'm looking at the screen instead of the computer uh, and then we provide a function in which we pick a random value so um, let's go with x brand um, say 0.5 to 2 so an octave up or an octave down and a comma at the end so if we just run this a bit here, you can see we're generating, um, I don't know if that's big enough to see, but uh, an array of random floating point values. And when we provide an array of arguments inside of a UGen, it's uh, not just redundant, but erroneous to also expand the UGen itself. So now that we have these eight values, uh, play buff will sort of, exp the, the multi-channelness, the, uh, the array will uh, uh, propagate outward so that play buff becomes an array of play buffs uh, in which these rate arguments are sequentially distributed. And that's much more interesting than what we just heard. All of a sudden, the sound comes to life and we have um, all this activity instead of the exact same signal uh, playing out of each speaker in which I just get a bland mono mix of all of those. So this is a lot more exciting. Uh, as an alternative to this, um, uh, this is one, this is certainly, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. I tend to do it, um, actually let me undo that. Slightly different syntax is you can create a function delineated with curly braces and then just say exclam 8 at the end of that. Uh, this function by itself just returns a function, right? 
it's got its content sort of tucked away inside those curly braces. But when we duplicate a function, not only do we create an array of function copies, but that function is then evaluated for each duplication. So very, very convenient syntax. And we get the same array of eight things. But there's still a sort of sameness to them because they're all starting at the same point in this file. You know, the very beginning of the sound always kind of sounds the same. So it might be nice to uh, have them all start at a different uh, frame in the buffer. So we'll skip ahead to start pause. And here we'll do the same thing here. We will just uh, multi-channel expand, uh, you know, provide another eight size array for the start position. So I've just copied and pasted for convenience, but these are not good numbers because frames are only integers. We cannot start at the 1.9th frame or anything like that. So it's better to do a linear distribution here with uh, R rand. And we'll start at somewhere between 0 and the number of frames in the buffer. This buffer happens to have 96,682 frames. We technically need to do minus 1 here because this is how many frames they are, but they start at index 0. So this is the last frame. And this will give us an array of eight integers, which are valid starting positions in each buffer. And then we need a comma at the end here as well. It's a subtle difference, but now um, not only are they running at different rates, but they're all starting completely randomly out of sync and out of phase with each other. So so what happens, and, and I just want to point out that um, this is not redundant, having two exclam eights. This is not a, uh, an expansion of an expansion. These work in parallel. So Playbuff has an array of eight things for playback rate, and Playbuff also has an array of eight things for start position. And when this explodes outwards, we get the zeroth value and the zeroth value for the first item in that array, and then the first and the first, and the second and the second. So they just fall into place very neatly that way. Um, okay. Um, now what happens if we do something like this? Let's undo and redo or even maybe 48. Right. Uh, does it sound any different to you? No, that's because it's uh, wh what's happening is we've only allocated uh, enough. We, I mean, technically, we've allocated 10 hardware output buses, uh, the first two of which we're not using based on how the interface is connected. But we only have eight available channels and eight speakers. So if we make this array even larger, those extra signals just get written to internal software hardware, uh, software audio buses. And those, you know, that's, that's useful for, say, passing a signal to a reverb effect inside Super Collider. But we're not doing anything like that. So, so these extra 40 signals just don't go anywhere. And this is where Splay AZ comes in handy. This is exactly what Splay AZ is for. Splay AZ. We provide the number of channels in our ring, and then we provide an array with an arbitrary size. And Splay is going to place all these channels uh, equidistantly in this ring. Uh, and I'm going to start with the amplitude down because you know, we've made 48 signals, and I, this is just whenever you're adding or multi-channel expanding or, you know, growing a sound somehow, this is never a bad idea. You know, I, it's, it's not guaranteed to protect you, but... Ah, okay, here's an interesting message, which I would expect to sort of stump everyone here. <laughs> it stumped me for many years. Exception in graph def receive exceeded number of interconnect buffers. I'm not going to go into very much detail here. When we play a function like this internally, secretly, a synth def is built. And because we have 
uh, 48 signals, and there's a lot of internal uh, software building that happens in order to produce this sound. And there's a default setting in server options called number or num wire buffs. I think the default is 64. Um, even I'm not 100% sure what all of this means, but I do know that you can um, you know, sort of arbitrarily increase this number. I'm not sure it even has to be a power of 2. Um, I, I usually just choose powers of 2, just in case that's required. So we'll try 1024 and reboot the server. And by doing that, we've also destroyed our buffer, so we have to read our sound files in again. So we've got that again. So let's try this again. And now it works. And it is very quiet, so I think we can very safely turn this up. And I don't think we even need this. We can just comment this out. Right. Yes. The error was, uh, I think we still have it. Uh, here it is. It says, yeah, graph def underscore receive exceeded number of interconnect buffers. And because that that's our clue that the server wasn't able to actually construct the synth def, uh, which is why when it tries to play it, it says the synth def that I wasn't able to build is not found, well, of course, because it didn't wasn't able to build it because uh, the algorithm was, was uh, too complex for the default parameters of the server. So we just change those parameters, reboot the server, and then we're in the clear. There are lots of uh, times when, maybe not lots, not very common, but for example, there's a cap on the number of buffers you're allowed to allocate. There's a cap on the number of, di the, the number of kilobytes of dynamic memory that you're allowed to allocate for like delay lines and things like that. So there's just sort of arbitrary caps on that, but then you can just change those restrictions reboot the server and um, yeah there's there's no the only real limitation is the power of your computer and the amount of memory you have available okay so this is play AZ we now actually have 48 signals which have been spatialized in an octophonic ring right. so you can arbitrarily increase these numbers you can make you don't have to always think in terms of I can only make eight signals at a time because I only have eight speakers. Not true. You can make an array of any number of signals, and uh, and then you can just sort of lay them out uh, in an arbitrary ring display. So that's very handy. Um, uh, maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, I showed just a very brief introduction to filters, right? Low pass filter and high pass filter. Now we're going to look at a what is essentially a filter, but um, it's a uh, more accurately, it's a resonator or a ringing filter. It's called, I, I don't think that, I, I would pronounce this ring Z. I think Z is somehow related to uh, filter math because there's a, there's a similar object called resin Z, uh, slightly different implementations. I just, I, I'm not convinced that the author of this class would just arbitrarily put a, a you know, a, a fun plural Z at the end of it. I think it actually has some meaning. Anyway, this is a ringing filter. We provide an input signal, just like low pass filter, high pass filter. We give it a resonant, a frequency at which we want this filter to resonate, and then a decay time, the amount of time for the uh, resonance of the output signal to decay by a full 60 decibels. Uh, yeah, that decay time is a, the amount of time it takes to decay by 60 decibels. And because this is a resonant filter, again, we should we should start with a mull value or just scale the amplitude uh, just so we don't blow ourselves out of the water first. So um, let's go back to just 8 just to keep things, you know, contained, I guess. And we'll say sig equals ring z dot ar. Uh, sig is our input signal. And let's... Just um, let's just say a thousand and a decay time of 0.1, and we are going to reintroduce this line which tries to protect our ears here, and this should. Yeah. It's a good thing we turned this amplitude way down, isn't it? <laughs> it's still quite loud for 
uh, scaling value of 0.02. And we can hear that all eight of these um, have been passed through a, this ring filter. So if we change this to 2000, this is part of the reason why I chose this uh, particular sound, because I knew it would take really well to uh, a resonant filter. So we remember we can create arrays like this. So this is the array 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, which sounds like this. Mm, and let's turn this up a little bit. This is the decay time of the filter. So we're resonating this buffer playback at uh, the first eight harmonics of a 100 hertz fundamental, and they're sort of spatialized equidistantly around the room. And if you're sitting where I am, you can sort of hear that it's in order. You hear the beginning of the series behind me, and then as my brain sees the space uh, going clockwise, I can hear the higher harmonics towards my right. Um, but we can always dot scramble an array, and this reorders them randomly. Hmm. Okay, and what I'd like to do here now is go back to our 48 version, scale this back down, and let's say exp rand between, I'm going to make this a little bit more readable. Uh, let's say 200 and 8,000. Exclaim 48. Let's start it with a, a shorter decay time. And just to see what resonant frequencies we have, if we really wanted to, we can say dot post ln and yeah. it won't even uh, won't even show us the whole thing. But um, we can see we've all we've got these all these random frequencies. So these are the, the buffers themselves are playing at different rates. They have different start positions, and then they get passed through forty eight unique uh, resonant filters. And what I had playing at the start of class, I, I changed this so it was a little bit different. Um, uh, so we have uh, scale dot minor pentatonic dot degrees gives us integers corresponding to scale degrees. Right, so bum 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 bum, and then we can transpose that by just adding some MIDI value. So 60 is MIDI note C. And now we've got sort of a pentatonic scale and a more reasonable range of MIDI notes. Um, we can say uh, dot choose dot MIDI CPS. And this gives us it's, what it's doing is it's picking one of those five scale degrees in the minor pentatonic scale and converting it to cycles per second, which is what rings expects. It's going to treat that as a value in hertz. Uh, and then to further transpose that, we can multiply it by um, 0.5, 1, or 2, and choose one of those as well. So now, not only are we picking a random value, but some of them will be transposed. It looks like this one, 195, went down an octave. This 783 went up an octave. 
And then finally, put this all in curly braces to delineate a function and say exclam 48. Let's turn that up a little bit. And the last thing I did before I uh, started class was I, I set this. I, instead of a, a fixed decay time, I want to use the mouse to control the decay time. So at the left edge of the screen, a decay time of 0 0.05 seconds. And at the right edge of the screen, a decay of three seconds. And the third argument will be one, which corresponds to an exponential mapping. Um, and then I think that's sort of all we need. So as I move the mouse to the left, you can hear the, the resonant decays of each of those little percussive bursts is much shorter. Nice Eugen rings, really great. When you've got a, a spectrally rich, animated sound, you can you can make all sorts of lovely uh, sonorities with it. Uh, the last thing I did was declare an argument called uh, sorry, there's no equals there. Arg notes, and normally our arguments are just single numerical values. It is possible to declare an array argument, but you must precede the array with the um, I guess we call this hashtag now that it's 2018. Uh, ampersand? Is that the word? No, that's the... What is this actually called? Pound sign. Hmm? Pound. pound. Sure, we'll call it a pound sign. Yeah. Um, and I, I think what I did was I replaced this part of the code with notes. And I declared it as an argument here. This pound sign makes this array into a literal array. Uh, literal is a technical term, which means it, it is immutable, which means we cannot change it. We can't change the size. We can't add items to it or take items. It's, it has the same immutability as, say, an integer. We can't change an integer. Three is always three. And so now this array is always this array. But we can pass in a new literal array to change it while it's playing. So this should sound exactly the same. And oh, we, we also need to give this synth that we're creating, the whole thing, a name. So I'll just call it x. And we will say x.set uh, notes. And then. Um, we might need this here, we might not. I'm, I'm going to put it there and see what happens. So then I did just a different transposition of values. And then we can just say x dot free whenever we're done. That's the you know sloppy way to do it. If you wanted to fade it out, you'd declare an envelope here, you know, set it equal to some sort of ADSR shape with a gate argument, and then you can fade it in and then arbitrarily, whenever you want, fade it back out and be a little bit more elegant with that. Um, and at this point I would like to uh, do a do an export of this sound and um, just remind you all how to do it. I'm going to assign your final project today, which you'll work on for the rest of the semester. And I'll expect you to use Super Collider to 
create and manipulate sounds and then render them out as audio files. And then if you like, if you want to work entirely in Super Collider, that's totally fine. But if you feel comfortable in a DAW work, uh, workflow, then you can uh, export these sounds and pull them into a DAW and work with them there. So let's do that very quickly. You can see I've set my record channels to 10 already. So we'll say s dot make GUI and record. Now we're going to go hunt down those files, which go to um, music, Super Collider Recordings, and this one at 3:35. And of course, there are you know lots of different types of software are capable of doing this. This is just what we have, and this is what I'm comfortable with. So we just get rid of those first dummy tracks, those first pair of dummy tracks, and then we're going to um, now this is this all looks good, so we will export multiple and AIF 24 bit is what I'm going to go with. We'll call this rings one, and then we're going to number after this file prefix. I'm going to put these in my week eight and output. I already have rings zero, which I did earlier, so that's why I named them rings one. And output successful. Right, that's what that means. Now we can we can quit or just hide Audacity. And tuck that away. And just confirm. Here we go. Rings one through rings eight. So let's open up logic. And I'm going to start with eight audio tracks with no input, starting at output three. And that's going to give us three through ten. There they are. And we will just simply drag and drop. I know I showed this last time. It's probably good to show it again. And for this part of the assignment, if you have your own DAW and you want to work on your laptop in here and hook up to the um, the Motu, that's totally fine. Um, uh, so, but if we're working in Logic, then one interesting thing you can do is, uh, oops, I want those, thank you. Uh, you can press Command 2 to bring up the mixer. And what I did before class is I, I created an auxiliary send from each of these tracks, which uh, has the result of creating eight auxiliary tracks. So I'm going to click and shift click for all of these, create a bus send, and send them to eight different buses. And you can see as I'm creating these, uh, aux tracks are automatically being created for me. And I'm also going to have these aux tracks go out mono to the same eight speakers. There is probably some sort of fancy keyboard shortcut to do this automatically, because this seems like the kind of thing, this is why DAWs exist, so you don't have to do stuff like this. Um, let's just be glad that we don't have, you know, 16 speakers or something or a hundred, which just makes me even more convinced that there's a, there's a way to do this more, more quickly.
Okay. Uh, we are going to make all of these sends pre-fader. Just, just sort of select them, click and hold right here, pre-fader. And we'll just turn them up to a sensible value. And that means that even if these faders are down, the sends occur pre-fader. So they show up on these aux tracks here, right? Bus 1 going to aux 1, bus 2 going to aux 2. Oops. Uh, but we can also turn these down and turn these back up. And just so we don't have to keep stopping and starting going back to the beginning, we will select everything and command U will set the loop locators around this um, this region. So that's sort of convenient. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll just uh, only listen to the, the part that has sound in it for now. Yeah. So now back to the mixer. Uh, the advantage of creating these aux tracks and doing ascend is we can put effects on these aux tracks and then if we come up with another gesture, uh, you know, we can make another pair of eight source tracks and then, you know, also send those to bus one through eight and also apply the effects to those and just get a little bit more fluid with signal flow. Um, so, uh, what we can do is let's put a reverb here and we'll go with, uh, we're going to initialize a new impulse response with this, uh, this Prince Hall one. And then let's go ahead and solo this, uh, bring these down and bring these up. But just solo the one so we can hear just the reverb. Increase the size. Now it's got a really long tail to it. One thing that's sort of nice to do sometimes. Oh, it looks like it's added all of these. I didn't want that to happen yet. I think it's because I had them all selected when I put the plug in on the first track. I want to adjust my reverb so it's just so. Mm. And then, then copy it. So. Something that sounds sort of nice is to put uh, put a um, uh, a low pass filter. It's just not quite quite as bright. This is I don't know. Seems seems this is a little more appealing to me. Right, and once we've got those, we can hold the Alt or Option key, and then just copy them. And these these will have the exact same. Uh, settings. This is really nice. Sort of. We'll do it with these as well. Some of you might even be able to figure out even faster ways to do this than me. And then. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to make these all the same value. I can uh, alt click on them and bring them up. I was just worried to be too loud. Yeah. Maybe I'll turn these faders down for a moment and then we'll do it this way. Just turning down the mixer instead of the DAW. So now we've got uh, oh, they're soloed, that's right. I think that's what we want. Yeah. There is no reason you can't do this in Super Collider. You certainly can. You'll have a different reverb algorithm. Um, but this is just, once you've made your sounds, I assume some of you just will feel a little more comfortable 
uh, doing adjustments in time and applying effects in this sort of environment, which is totally fine. I, I sort of split it between SuperGlider and DAW myself sometimes. Uh, and uh, one last thing to show, uh, if you, you, know, you find yourself doing this sort of thing, if you want to record that data, you can just set the uh, automation mode to latch, and I've already actually probably started writing that data, maybe. Um, well, let's maybe not. Let's yeah. Let's try it. Let's try it again. So here, uh, let's go back to our mixer here and uh, start these down here. set these to latch also. Oops. Oh, I've moved I've moved my tracks around. Let's see if I can Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. But see I have one and then two through eight here. Uh alright. Well we'll just deal with it. I think we can still do that. Hmm. that gets written onto the tracks. So we have our, I think we can, so I know we can sort them this way, I'm pretty sure. So if we just select those and drag them up here, ah, much better. So here's our volume automation for the source tracks and our volume automation for the effects tracks. And once you're done with all that, it's a good idea to set them back to read so that you don't accidentally overwrite your, your data. So this is just a quick examination of one possible workflow or approach you might take when you're composing your piece. Um, so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. <laughs>